All right, guys, let's take a look at section four. And this particular section is going to uh, get into So let's take a look at section four. Um, that section will deal with water flow and balancing on uh, hydronic systems. So some of the things we're gonna take a peek at here is looking at devices that we can use to either measure or balance water flow. Uh, that may be part of uh, your pumps, um, integral to them. There's a number of different devices that are out there. Um, we'll look at, uh, you know, essentially look at how you would select the pump based on your calculated flow rate, which is simply based on the BTUs per hour. You can calculate that in your temperature drop or temperature, uh, temperature drop in the system. And also we're going to take a look at how do we measure pump pressures and determine the flow rates based on a, a real life operating system. So we're going to take a look at that. So if we start out with the first section here on this, on our section four, I think one of the questions would be, you know, why, why would I need to have balancing? Why do I need to have that? And I think one of the areas of balancing that would be important, I guess, is that we're making sure we're bringing the right amount of water flow to the, to the appropriate areas within the system. Um, usually that's kind of dictated either based on a temperature rise or a temperature drop, depending on what we're doing. Um, we want to make sure we also have the right amount of water being maybe moving through a, a boiler or a chiller. So for example, um, when you have systems such as let's say a water chiller and you've got to move water through that water chiller, there's a certain minimum flow rate or really almost a design flow rate. Sometimes they'll have a minimum, sometimes they'll have a maximum, but there's a, a range of where they want that water flow in and we have to know how to determine that. Uh, and that's typical from the field service standpoint. Um, there are issues that if you have too much water flow, usually that'll kind of lead to excessive pressure drops in systems. It could even lead to some, uh, I would say, problems with maybe valves, valve seats, um, possibly other areas that could become a problem. And we'll look at uh, what we need to do. And obviously we want to make sure our terminal units have an appropriate amount of water and not too much certainly not too little. So let's take a look at some of these. So the, uh, the devices that would be used to measure that those points within that system or to control really water flow would either be a multi-purpose valve. Um, that is oftentimes we refer to that as a triple duty valve. I'll talk a little bit about that. We have a venturi tube and we have orifice plates. And there are some variations um, of those types of valves um, out there. So let's take a look at, at some of these as well. Some of the um, of these devices obviously provide other functions and features. So they make devices, um, in fact nowadays they even make uh, kind of an ultrasonic flow meter. Uh, so they have devices that will allow you to actually measure the flow without really even having almost probes in the water. Um, so there's some pretty interesting um, devices out there. I know uh, when I've gone out to Lambeau Field and looking at their mechanical systems, they have some uh, devices, uh, sensors on their water chillers that um, allow them to, they can actually measure the pulses of water. It's pretty amazing. Uh, they, uh, they can measure the, the pulses as the water flows through there. Um, they will emit a signal through that water system and it'll determine its water flow. It's pretty amazing on that. So, but a lot of times, you know, most of the devices that are used in the field, primarily it's, we need to be able to measure pressure drop, whether it's through, you know, whether it's pressure increase created by a pump or whether it's pressure decrease, that would be uh, by, uh, as a result of the water moving through a system on there. And, and based on that, the manufacturer can actually give us the information that's needed to determine the GPM of a system. So it's it's pretty, uh, it's pretty incredible. Um, this is an example of one of the, the higher tech type systems out there that can be used to read uh, in feet of water, feet of head. It uh, can be electronic that, uh, that they will have certain probes that we can measure or put into a system to attain uh, 
certain types of uh, flow rates. We can essentially uh, very accurately measure uh, those. Now, lots of, lots of manufacturers have probes or kits that are out there. Many, many of them, uh, just as this one, is primarily going to be using a, a differential pressure type of an instrument that'll allow them to, to correctly measure and determine how many GPM would actually be moving uh, through those systems. So they're, um, but like I said, there's, very, there's a lot of the systems out there that do this. So um, the, the, probably the biggest challenge that I guess I would have to point out in some of these is if you, if, you, know, if you don't do a lot of water type systems, and I would have to guess this is really gonna be way more commercial than residential, but if you have to do a lot of water flow and critical flow measuring, I would say a kit like this would be worth your money. If you don't do a lot of those systems, it's difficult to justify the cost of these. So this um, particular one, I wanna show you a couple of different types of balancing valves that are out here. And um, the one up in the top left, this one happens to be what they call a circuit setter by Bell and & Gossett. And um, let me get my pen back on here. So this B&G um, circuit setter, this one will have a cap that you can pull off of both of these two points here and here. And they will have a probe that you have to buy a kit or you get a kit for measuring certain types of these uh, instruments or whether it's through Elnor or uh, any other brand or company that has these kits out there. You can insert and measure the difference across the valve. Now, what's interesting about this particular device is this is actually, this is really a, a ball valve. So there's an actual round valve that is rotated or turned and there's certain numbers of degrees that you're gonna notice. So when we look at this one, we can see there are certain number of degrees that are um, evident on whether it's anywhere from zero to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 degrees. So the only way you would know how much water flow is going through there is you would have to have their app downloaded and using in using that where you can punch into the app the number of degrees that the valve is open and your differential and the valve size based on that information it will then give you um, the amount of gpm that is being measured this is i would say this is probably not the most accurate of the valves and i'll and i'll tell you the reason why the biggest reason why this one would probably not be the most accurate would be that you have a ball, there's an, an actual ball valve in that in between these two ports, which would create a fair amount of turbulence in the downstream port. So whatever the direction is that you happen to be moving the water flow, uh, that's what's going to kind of dictate or determine that. So for example, um, if the water is moving in this direction, this one will be very stable, but this one here is gonna have a lot of turbulence and it, you know, it's not that it's not gonna be stable as far as the reading, but you know, the, some of the accuracies are questionable. Now, keep in mind, this is an instrument that's been out there for many, many years. And there's really no, um, you know, certainly Bell and Gossett, that's, you know, I'm sure they know their business. So it's just, uh, it's one of those where they have other types that might be a little bit more accurate, um, but there might be a cost um, associated with that accuracy as well. So this other one um, right below that is really doing the same thing. You're measuring a delta P that's gonna be between this port and this port that we would be measuring. And again, same application. You determine the size, you determine how many degrees uh, that it's being open or closed, and then you can determine uh, what your water flow rate is on this particular system. So again, really neat little system. Um, this particular next one here is actually called a triple duty valve. So um, this triple duty valve, and another word for a triple duty valve is a multi-purpose valve. Um, that would be the other thing. So I'm gonna put that on your multi-purpose. Uh, uh, valve. Now, it actually does um, three different types of, I would say, three different types of, um, um, it serves as three different functions. And one of the functions is, this would be a really a check valve, 
So this will provide me as a check valve. Okay, that's one of them. You can notice right here, there's a flow balancing valve in here. So let's just call it a flow um, balancing. And that's your valve, okay, flow balancing valve. And the other thing, the, the third thing that it does is it provides a shutoff. Now, it's one of those where we can, we can balance the flow. And again, we're gonna do the same types of things as these two, where we're gonna be able to, as the other two on the left side here, we're gonna actually measure a difference in pressure. So one of the ports is right here. So you're gonna get that pressure. And there's a port on this pot, top part, which is not um, shown right at this point. Uh, but on the other side of this valve, there's going to be also a pressure port that's going to be on there. And that pressure port, based on that differential, that's what's going to help us determine what our water flow is. And again, you're going to have to use the specific uh, manufacturer's devices that are on there. So it's pretty incredible uh, what they have on these devices. So very common commercially. This is typically going to be placed in a, on a commercial application uh, for um, those types of systems. So usually in the discharge side of the pump, it will be there. All right. Well, let's take a look at the next type of a valve. And this, this next valve, uh, very interestingly, is a, uh, this one here happens to be, let's see if I can get this to go off of here. All right. So looks like it's being a little stubborn. So this one here happens to be a pressure independent characterized control valve that uh, is made by Belimo. Now there are other manufacturers out there that actually have a valve that is like this. Now what's really interesting about this is that uh, one, of the, one of its design characteristics is such that if the differential pressure across a valve changes, this valve, so I'm talking about the delta P, or maybe even you could even think of it as if the inlet pressure, so if this pressure starts to rise up, um, if that pressure starts to rise up and you have a bigger delta P, this valve will automatically close down a slight amount to give you the correct amount of water flow. So it actually can maintain whatever you deem or, or set it up as the as the water flow that's being desired it can actually maintain that um, at certain points within the system it's really a, a phenomenal valve but that's um, this one here is a it's a really nice little system so i'll give you an example where this really might be a nice feature um, if you've got valves in the out in a commercial uh, system or an air handler and maybe you're trying to control a certain amount of water flow through this unit um, you can you could set it up that even when that valve is wide open and maybe you know it's very common in a, in a system that the pressure going in it, into a valve could actually rise up and when that happens that's very it's very likely that your flow rate through that valve is going to increase when that happens that leads to some control problems that um, could become a problem for you in out in, in your commercial applications i don't know if you know, if anybody would use this in a residential system, it certainly is not a, um, I could see them using it on a heat pump system that would maybe use some sort of a flow, maybe a, a pump and dump type system where you're pumping it out of a well through a heat exchanger and then out, it could do that. But um, it, it's really more of a commercialized type of a valve, but very effective VAV boxes. Um, it's uh, very much an energy saving type of a device. So it's really a pretty neat uh, type of system. All right, so let's take a look at um, these particular systems. And uh, there are, I've, I've got um, a couple of different types here. So this first one that I wanna hit up on is called the Venturi tube. Now the Venturi tube, I would say is probably one of the most accurate um, measuring devices that are out there. And now what makes this uh, type of a valve so accurate is the fact that if you bring the water to you're bringing water through this valve it has a pressure port that it's going to measure in the first one here I'm going to zoom in here a little bit it has a pressure port that's on the first one this one's going to be the higher pressure 
This one's gonna be my lower pressure. And what will happen then is, as it travels through this little, this little venturi right in this area, there will be a small amount of pressure drop. So we will have a delta P that's gonna be in between these two ports. When we measure that delta P and we have the, what I would call the characteristic or the CV factor of this particular uh, measuring device, we can very, very accurately measure the flow rate through a device. So for uh, commercial jobs where you may want to accurately know what your GPM is through a coil, through a chiller, through any type of a device out there that would be maybe somewhat critical on water flow and you really want to know what you have, or it could be some sort of a, um, another application where maybe you are trying to do some sort of energy calculation where you are keeping track of how much energy is this chiller system providing out into the system. We can measure flow rate, we can measure the, the temperature difference on the system, and then with a calculation we can figure out the BTUs that are being um, consumed over a period of time. So it's really a, a phenomenal system, but very, very accurate uh, device. Um, Taco actually makes, and there's other vendors out there that do that as well, they actually make a system that incorporate, it's, it's almost a combination of the Venturi and what it does is they include um, a valve that's in here. So on the Taco device, they put the Venturi going into the valve and then what they do is they have the balancing valve here. And it's, so it's a little ball valve that actually rotates and what, what they're doing, what makes it so accurate is they measure the um, Delta P prior to the valve, which eliminates the turbulence that I had talked about in the previous one. So it's a really neat little system. The next one that we deal with is called an orifice plate. And the orifice plate is a very good system out there as well. Um, you'll notice this one is set up in a flange type of a system where they're bolting it in between, you know, with all these flanges, they're bolting this little plate in between two piping sections. Um, and what they're doing is they're going to measure the delta P. And if the, based on that delta P, they're going to use the curve that is provided by the manufacturer. So they're calling this the calibration chart. So based on that delta P, you'll simply go either over to the chart and you go straight down and it'll provide you whatever that GPM happens to be. However that gets done on there but that's a, another neat little system but um, again very very neat little system whatever is out there um, that you have but those are what those devices are doing they're just simply measuring a delta p and then they can figure that out um, my my preference would certainly be the venturi tube but uh, you know i would take whatever is is out there um, the way that a lot of these will do this for you guys that deal with more commercial type things um, based on what they do is they will end up taking the square root of the delta P and they will actually multiply that number times what they call the coefficient or the CV of the, of the device. And based on that, what I can do is I can actually calculate um, really what the GPM is of that, uh, of that system. So what is going through there. So there are ways that they'll do this uh, in the field. So. All right, let's take a look at the next one. So how do we determine flow rate? Really simple. They, they just simply, uh, and I talked about this in the, really in the first module, and um, where we take the hourly heat loss. So in other words, this is really, you know, what is the, how many BTUs per hour are you running in a system? And they're taking that times the temperature difference, and in this case, it would be degrees Fahrenheit. The 8.33 is the weight of the water, and the 60 is the minutes per hour. And based on that calculation, you can actually determine how many GPM a system will really want. Now, there's times where maybe I want a 20 degree delta T, and there's times maybe I want a 10. So, for example, if I'm dealing with a, uh, let's say, a high mass concrete floor for a, um, for example, uh, uh, I'll give you an in-floor heating example for a hydronic system. So on uh, earlier in uh, the previous sessions, we had talked about in-floor heating and what, what, what would happen in in-floor heating is they'll have a manifold and they might have several of these uh, PEX tubes that'll go out into the system and then they will come back in a 
um, let's say in a, a return uh, manifold. Now what will happen is every one of these, a lot of times in your high mass concrete, they will have a delta, a temperature difference across, those, across the supply and across the return. Now based on that supply and return delta T, which that could be potentially you know, 10 degrees that they, would, that they might want. So in that situation, they might supply you somewhere around 90 to maybe 100 degrees, 110 degrees in that area. So right in that area would be a typical supply on a, on a high mass concrete job. Um, it could be even lower in some situations, but that's probably more common. And um, based on that, um, that'll tell you what your water flow is needed. And you may have several of these. So you might have several of the tubes that'll go into the manifold. And again, just, um, they'll have that all set up in there. Now, if I know in an area, hey, I've got a region then, maybe this region happens to be, um, let's say, you know, 5,000 uh, BTUs in, a, in an area, 5,000 BTUs per hour, is maybe I calculate that out as my heat load. And all right, I want a 10 degree delta T. So um, in that case, so then I'll take that times Essentially, 8.33 times 60 is where our 500 factor came into play earlier. So what ends up have or happening in this situation, if you punch that out into the system, you'll, you'll find that 5,000, and you'll divide that by 10 degrees, and uh, times that 500 factor, and you'll find that in this situation, we are going to need exactly one GPM. So we might, if we happen to have three tubes or th we might have divvied it up over two tubes or one tube, they would tell me that I want one gallon a minute through this area. So that would mean I would uh, need to figure, you know, out where exactly where I want to go with uh, how I'm going to divvy this up. So typically what happens is, you know, in any type of an in-floor heating type application, we would try to to evenly divide up all of the tubing lengths and each, whatever that requirement for flow is in that area, we would divide that up equally amongst those. That's typically the way we would want to do that. So anyways, real neat little system. So in determining that. Um, in this particular example, we'll use a more typical on the boiler side. So in the boiler side, if I've got a boiler system or maybe a, a house heating system that's got 110,000 BTUs, the, you can calculate what the water flow rate would be in GPM uh, using a delta T of around 20 degrees. Now, earlier I had mentioned that a normal delta T was about 20 degrees in a system. So if you take 20 times this right here will come up to pretty close to 500. So if you take 500 times 20, that comes up to 10,000, which tells me that every 10,000 BTUs per hour, I need about one gallon a minute if I'm going to do it on a 20. If I want to do it on a 10 degree, I would need double the flow. I would need um, exactly double the flow in this case. So in this example, every, um, in this 110,000 B2 application divided by 10,000, that would tell you you need your 11 gallons a minute in this case. If I wanted a 10 degree delta T, I would need 22. So it's a very much a proportional type of a system, but that's really how we figure out what our flow is in a system. All right, so let's take a look at the next application here, and we're going to look at pump, uh, let's say a pump selection or a pump curve in here, and what we're going to do is this. Uh, so how do we read this? So in this example, I'm showing, it says locate the 11 gallons a minute across the horizontal axis and then read it up to the various curve to see where that feet ahead would be, um, and can your system, you know, overcome that? So... In this particular case here, I've got, let's say 11 gallons a minute. I go up to the curve, and this one here is showing the example pump curve. And in this particular situation, we're finding that we can handle, or this pump will develop about 9.2 feet ahead. Now, you need to make sure, you need to make sure that your system doesn't have more than that much feet ahead is where it would be. Now, if we utilize these other curves, um, and I'll do that as an example. Um, whoops, back up a sec. Um, if I were to use these other curves, so let's say that we've got 30. Right here, I'll use that as 30. 
32, 4, 6, 8, and 40. So if I go to 30, whoops, if I go to 32 GPM and I go straight up until I intersect, let's say this particular um, 3 and 5 eighths inch um, impeller diameter size, and I go straight across, that will tell me that maybe it happens to be, you know, 9 or 8.9 uh, or something like that. Uh, it'll be in that area about how many feet ahead that we might have. So based on the feet ahead that's available, um, that allows us to determine really what our friction loss rate would be for that piping system and how we're going to design it. Now, that's one way to do that. Now, typically when I do these things, I usually have an idea in my mind of about a, a, a typical friction loss rate, but this is certainly one that might be a little bit more um, conservative to do that. Um, generally, I use a standard, um, a standard rate, um, and I try to make sure my piping system is, is going to be, the pump will be uh, large enough to handle that, and that's probably more typical of most people in the field as well. So why in the world do we have friction loss? Why do we get this? Why do we have X amount ahead if we're gonna move this much, uh, or the pump's gonna say I can do this, I can overcome this much resistance? Well, what determines the friction loss rate um, of a system is really based on the flow. The more flow you have, the higher the friction loss rate. That's really a second pump law calculation where the, where the flow changes by the square of that GPM percentage change. So if you double the flow rate, your pressure drop will actually go up by two squared, but which would be, of course, four times. If I were to, um, and that's very, again, I think I talked about that earlier. It's really hard to do that. So that's, uh, that's kind of the way that we normally look at. So the more velocity, the higher the flow rate, the higher the flow rate, the more the velocity, the higher the pressure drop. There's lots of different things that would go on um, in a system. Now, this particular friction loss rate um, calculation is another uh, way to do this. And this is actually not a bad way to do it, at, at least to double check. Now, the, the part, one of the reasons why I don't typically use this, this calculation or this method in most cases is primarily because there are so many different circulating pumps that are available that I usually can pick out a pump that's reasonable enough that does the job, we're well within normal acceptable guidelines as far as pump resistance um, or system water flow resistance. But I'll go through the calculation here for the sake of doing this. The way this is done is by taking the permissible head. This is the head that is that you had obtained from the pump curve. So in this example, we had 9.2 feet ahead. That's where this one would be. We would have 9.2 feet ahead. Now, and then you would, of course, divide that by your equivalent um, pipe length of your circuit or of your system, and then multiply that times 100. And that'll give you what they call the friction loss rate in feet ahead per 100 feet. And that's typically the way that we do that um, if, we get, if we're going to do a calculation like this. Now, um, there's another way, uh, and here they're using milli inches per foot and then the factor is 12,000. This is not, I, I suppose you could do this, I've never had to do this one in uh, any real life application. So this one isn't, it's not a bad calculation, it's just that I think that in most cases it's really not um, completely necessary in most cases. Uh, I would say as, as, as a general rule, you know, we might deal with somewhere in that, um, usually around that three, uh, roughly around three feet ahead per 100 feet is a typical friction loss rate that we would try to stay within. I think in most cases when we're trying to pick a system out of here, what we're really trying to do is we're trying to, to maybe set it up to uh, make sure you have proper velocities really to get the air moving through the system. So if there's any air in the system, you want to try to push that through. So that's really what probably dictates my pressure drop uh, and my sizing. But in this example, we had 9.2. We had 250 equivalent feet for the system um, based on the, you know, the equivalent length of the pipe in that system. And if you do the calculation, 9.2 divided by 250 times 100, you'll come up with about an acceptable friction loss rate of 3.68 feet per 100 feet of, of run. So that is where you would try to pick your pipe sizes based upon that. Again, very simple system. 
Um, it's a good calculation if um, you want to verify, you know, if nothing else, it also helps you determine in a circuit, hey, maybe I've got a circuit that has low resistance, I can actually maybe cheat a little bit of my pipe sizing and cut it back a little bit. What I find is typically that's harder to do, but if you are an experienced technician, you can take a look at the system and say, hey, this is a short run, I don't have a lot of resistance, I can tend to say, all right, uh, you know what, this one I can use a, a smaller size on this one, and, and you can get away with that in most cases. But again, you have to know what, you really have to know what you're doing uh, in order to do that. So here's another little calculation that you should know, and uh, I wanna, I'm gonna point this out here. So not a bad, not a bad calculation. What they're showing you is, you know, how much head do you have in here? And I, I would say that the beauty of this is this actually will correct for different densities of the solutions or the fluids in your system. Now by taking the, the delta P, this is the difference between the suction of the pump and the discharge of the pump. And we're gonna get that, we can get that in PSI. If we, uh, we can get that in PSI. So this delta P that we're gonna get here times 144. 144 is essentially how many square inches would be in a square foot. So this one here is a constant that you're gonna get. And you're gonna divide that by the density. So the density of that fluid that you're moving through the system. Based upon that, you can figure out exactly the true corrected head based upon um, whatever that fluid is in, in your system. So, so what, do we, what do we need that for? Um, why do I need to know that? Um, I guess it, it's a way to kind of correct for different densities, different fluids, um, ultimately. So in this example, we've got a pump that has a head pressure developed in that pump and the differential across the pump ends up being 10.8 pounds per square inch. So we've got a gauge prior and a gauge after, or we're using, generally I like to use the same exact gauge, just one gauge, not unless you have a, a tool that can measure differential. And so when we're pumping water, that standard, standard density, 62.4 pounds per square foot or per cubic foot, We'll take 10.8 times the 144, divide that by your standard density of 62.4 for water, that will give me a head of about 24.92 feet of head is the way that that would happen. Now the beauty of this is that if we warm up water, we know that the density changes. We saw that earlier. When those molecules expand, they all of a sudden they get bigger and we get to, um, you know, they just don't weigh as much. So every cubic foot is doesn't weigh as much, it goes down. So that allows us to really correct for that. So it's, it's, um, it's pretty, uh, it's a good calculation. All right, so this particular um, chart. So let's take a look at this. So I wanna go back in this, in this, in this uh, system here. So in this, in this example, we measured 24.92 feet of head. So what I wanna do now is go on my curve here and on the left side of this particular pump curve, this is a commercial pump curve, but it doesn't really matter. It could be a residential curve. But let's say that we determine that we want to figure out where 20, 22, 24, this is 26. We're gonna be right in the middle and you go straight over. And where that circle dot is over here, that particular application will find that it intersects that pump where you've got a five and a quarter inch impeller that you'd have to know that. And that particular pump curve, when you go straight down, will tell you that, hey, you know, we happen to be running 40 gallons of water flow a minute through this particular pump. So just by knowing the differential across a pump, you can actually get a pretty good idea where approximately how much flow you need or how much flow that you actually have. Maybe it, it may not be what you need, but it tells you what you have. So that's kind of a, it's a pretty good, good little system that you have in there. You can also, um, um, this is also should really be almost a diagnostic uh, uh, measure. So for the guys that do your, you know, whether it's your commercial type of applications, you should be looking at differentials on a pump and recording them uh, periodically uh, during certain times just to see what is happening. So. All right, and uh, we'll take a look at this. So a couple of questions, I guess, so if to wrap this up. So if the friction loss would be increased, how would that affect your flow rate? So 
it, and again, I want to reiterate this. If the friction loss of the system increased, is increasing, so maybe that's a strainer that's closing or that's getting blocked up, that should actually cause our flow rate to go down. So when the loss or the pressure drop in the system um, goes down, or increases, I should say, not goes down, increases, that should yield me less water flow. Now, if the, if the flow rate, if I were to reword that and say, well, if I have more water flow, I will have a higher pressure drop. Um, it depends a little bit on the dynamics of a system and how that is. So we'll, we'll take a look at it. So next question. What happens when the density of the water changes if the water temperature is raised 100 degrees Fahrenheit above the standard 68 degrees Fahrenheit uh, density? And, you know, will the head pressure go up or down? And uh, if we do the calculation, what we'll find, um, if we correct those things, we'll actually determine that our, um, our head will stay constant. So it's a pretty neat little uh, system. So, all right, so let's go through some questions. For the most, ac the most accurate uh, pressure drop measurement of a water pipe, you would use which one of these? So an orifice plate, a venturi tube, a high pressure gauge, a back backflow gauge. I would have to say the venturi tube would make the most sense. Second one, so the friction loss in a piping or in a water pipe system occurs when air bubbles form, water flows, iron is used, I would say the, when water starts to move or water flows. So that's a um, nice little basic system. Third question, the pressure taps that are used to measure a water or a pump's pressure differential must be located, now this is a good question, on the suction side of the pump, on the discharge side of the pump, right next to the impeller, or at the same height relative to the pump center line. Okay, now, I do want to talk a little bit about this, um, this question. And the answer is probably going to be at the same height relative to the pump center line. But in actuality, what we really need is we, we really need, um, we need it to do both A and B as well as D. And I'm going to go through an example of what I mean by that. So if I take a system, I'll go back to this page here. So if I take a, a pumping system, and I'm going to use this example. So if I have a piping system, and I have a, a circulating pump located in a vertical line, I'm going to draw my pump. My water is going to flow this way. And I have a pressure tap here, and I have a pressure tap here. What I do not want to do is I don't want to measure the pressure on a gauge here and see that pressure and then take that gauge and move it down here. What they mean by that, and commercially we would not do that either. So what, what you have to make sure you do, no matter what you do for this, for measuring your, your pressure differential across the pump, if I keep and I have a hose connected to let's say this line, I'm gonna change my color of the pen. And so if I were to take a pressure here and I were to measure pressure right there, and then I take that hose off of here after I'm done getting that pressure, and then I move that hose down to here, either way, I will get the same delta P. In a commercial application, what we would see is we would likely see a tap coming out of here, a valve, you would have the, the gauge, and then you would have another um, valve here, and you would go directly into the other tapping. And what would happen then is what we would really be doing is we would, when we want to measure differential across a pump, we would close, you know, open up one of the valves at a time and record the pressure, and whatever that delta P is, that we can then go back and actually bring that and put that onto the pump curve to determine where, where that flow is. So. If I draw a basic pump curve, um, I should be able to say, all right, here's my delta P. This is how many feet ahead that I have. I'll go straight over until I intersect the curve, go straight down, and here is my GPM. And that's typically how we will do this. All right, so this concludes the last of that lecture series on the intro to hydronics. Um, after, at this point, um, if you've not completed all your assignments, you should be able to proceed to the module exam. So, all right. Thank you very much.